Yeah, this morning I, I did some work around the yard and I blew down the, the uh, courtyard and black, black dust everywhere. Mm -hmm. So I blew it all in the neighbor's car. <laughs> I, know he, I know he doesn't like that. Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland Devo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. If you're in the neighborhood, come on by. There's no excuses, Diana. Come on by. Have some fellowship. Uh, get to fellowship with everyone and then some prayer afterwards. it do you some good. <clears throat> Today we'll be in the book of Revelation chapter 17. So if you want to grab your Bibles, a cup of coffee, sit down, your highlighter. Let's do this uh, interesting chapter. Let's go ahead and, and pray. Uh, gracious Father, we come before you and we pray, Lord, for the Holy Spirit this morning to be our teacher, that he would enlighten us of his truth, that he would help us to understand, Lord, that he would bring it to light in what our current events are, and Lord, that we would be ministered by it, Father, the hope that we have in Jesus, Lord, and the love and the grace that he has upon us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. All right, Revelation chapter 17. I thought I heard someone come in. He did. Yvonne, oh. Well, hurry up, Yvonne. I'll take a picture of you while you're running by. <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right, let's get into uh, this morning's Devo, Revelation 17. We find the fall of the religious Babylon. So when you think of Babylon... Always tie it with religion, uh, not with the world system, not with government, not with superpowers, but religion. Their way of reaching God or their way of worshiping in some sort of false, idolatrous, sinful way, by the way. It is not a biblical religion. It is far from Christianity. It is totally the opposite of Christianity. And ultimately, that false religious system is going to be judged also, we see in the book of Revelation. In fact, in, in Revelation 16, 9 and chapter 14, 8, already declared Babylon as fallen. I, I like that about God. If you really believe his word, then his word is true and it will come true. And oftentimes you'll read in scriptures... He'll say things as though they're already done, which talks about his being omnipresent, his eternal state, right? Because for him, it is already done because he lives in eternity. That's something about eternity that we don't quite understand, that dimension. So past, present, and future is already done. God already sees us in heaven. And in fact, in his realm, we're already there and it's already complete. But yet here we are in the time dimension and we're not complete yet. We have to go through <clears throat> what it is that we need to go through to glorify him. So in his view, things have already happened. Um, so he can say that all of us here who are in Christ Jesus, that is who are born again, who are truly new creatures in Christ, who have truly have surrendered their hearts to him and have uh, forsaken all for his glory. I was thinking about that this morning how we get so busy as Christians. Even in this little church, even bigger churches have the same struggles as little churches just on a bigger scale. But there are a lot of people that are busy, busy with things. Uh, if their kids are in soccer or in music lessons or music school or um, you know, writing classes, uh, that takes up time and effort on a certain night of the week. Um, and then that's just the kids. If the adults then are in some sort of bunco or, or, or softball team or, or, you know, that takes up more time. So see what the enemy does is he's, he gets us busy with doing things in this world where we're not involved in church and we're not involved in doing things for the kingdom of God. Now, all those things can be done to glorify God and we do it for his glory and they're wholesome, wonderful, beautiful things. We may even do things like on a softball Christian team, you know, but it really isn't doing much as 
much as it should in a church. Oh, but we're witnesses, and I've been there, because we used to be on a softball team, and it got to the point where I was on a softball team once a week, then I loved it so much I wanted to do it twice a week, so now my Tuesdays and Thursdays were taken up from evening till 12 o'clock sometimes, and I'd be tired for the next morning. And even though we were doing it for the glory of God, and we were trying to be witnesses, and we'd have our Christian shirts on and share with people, but still, there was really no fruit, because they weren't really there for the Lord. So... Sometimes it may look good, but it's not always always good, and it takes us away from, <clears throat> from what God really wants to do. So in Revelation 17 and 18, we see the fall of Babylon carefully detailed here. And Babylon is mentioned 287 times in scriptures, more than any other city except Jerusalem. So the total opposite of Jerusalem would be Babylon, which would be a totally corrupt and evil, wicked city. Babylon was a literal city that was on the Euphrates River. To those familiar with the Old Testament, the name Babylon is associated with organized idolatry, blasphemy, and the persecution of God's people. And you see that mentioned in Genesis with the Tower of Babel and how they were trying to reach God in their own strength, all had one language, one people, one nation, one group, one religious system. And God then what? confuse them. Thus we get the name Babel and they were babbling in their language with each other they could not understand. <clears throat> so could be where languages were were birthed and you had different languages or it could be that languages were changed. Some have suggested that they spoke Hebrew in different languages but God changed them to something different. So uh, who knows exactly if that's where you got Spanish and French and you know I don't know and I don't think that that's the case, but their languages were changed. Look at verse 1. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, that is John the apostle, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. The waters always represent nations or peoples. And we saw that earlier in the other chapter. So when you see a glass full of water and blood, it's judgment upon the people. Uh, many waters is, could speak of nations and groups of people. And so he sees a great harlot who sits on many waters. So this harlot is sitting among many nations. <clears throat> the word harlot, by the way, is where we get our word pornikia, fornication. And so it is a system that is full of fornication. Look at verse 2. Uh, With whom the kings of the earth committed fornication. And this is the attraction of Babylon, right? Is the fornication. It is amazing how sensuality is so enticing and so attractive to so, so many. It used to be a sin, not necessarily <coughs> for men. There were women, but not as many women as we see today taking place. I think women now are being liberated because they want to be men so badly that now they're taking on even the sinful, evil natures of man themselves. What is fornication? That is having a relationship with someone outside of marriage. If you're not married and you're living with someone, sleeping with someone, hooking up with someone, uh, have a significant other, it's all considered fornication. It's lust. If you're married, then you're an adulterer or adulteress. And the enticement of this great nation is that it's okay. It's okay. Who's God to tell us what is right and wrong? We're acting out on our passions and our loves. It feels good. There's nothing wrong with it. We should be able to express ourselves. We should be able to, to home in on our gifts by trying it here and there and and you know, making it even better by having multitude partners and, and whether it's male or female or whether it's uh, threesomes or whether it's foursomes or whether it's swinging or whether it's, it's transgender or whether it's now pedophilers who are rebranding themselves. So it doesn't matter because it's all good and it's all love. And this is the great Babylon who was the harlot, that religious system who enticed men from the earth. Now, what did John see? Look at verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit in the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on, the scar on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemies, having seven heads and ten horns. So the harlot rides the same beast, that is the seven heads 
and the ten horse that was previously seen in Revelation chapter 13, the Antichrist and his dictatorship. These horns and these um, heads are representations of um, nations and kingdoms that are associated with Babylon. <clears throat> How does, I think we can get a picture of it today, though it's not gonna happen until then. <clears throat> Recently, um, there was a politician, Joyner, I believe his name was, whose computer was confiscated because of some of the emails that Hillary had lost on her personal server. Um, when they confiscated his emails, they found a lot of pornography. A lot of, they found stuff associated with slavery, sex slavery, trafficking, mm -hmm. and things like that. They don't say a whole lot about it, but that's what they found in this stuff. They were able to trace it back to an individual who owns an island uh, out somewhere that is a slave trafficking island for prostitution, homosexuality, all those things. Then they were able to connect Hillary and Bill Clinton to that island wow. and other politicians. Mm -hmm. So you see a little picture there of how this harlot, false prophet system entices men through those pleasure um, senses. Uh, we see it today and it has happened. You won't hear a whole lot about it. You have to do a lot of research uh, to find more about this, but we see it in our politicians. And I'll suggest to you that it's probably a lot worse than what we think uh, taking place uh, in those kingdoms. When you go back to the days of Rome, and you look at the emperors and what they were doing with homosexuality. Uh, there was one emperor who, who, who ended up marrying a male publicly. And then he decided that that wasn't enough. He wanted to become a wife to marry a male. And so he remarried and became the wife as the other was the male. And so you had that perversion <clears throat> that was taking place even during the time of Rome. And, and it <clears throat> has been taking place from the very beginning of time. Uh, <clears throat> Again, Genesis chapter 6, they did every imagination in their hearts, whatever they wanted to do. And so this is the enticement of the great Babylon. And it says in verse 4, The woman was arrayed in purple scarlet, adorned with gold, precious stones, pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. Uh, here, John writes, filthiness as an adjective to describe the fornication, right? Instead of just saying abomination of her fornication, he adds the adjective filthiness of her fornication. Uh, the purple and scarlets were colors of splendor, magnificence. Dyes made the fabric these colors, and they were rare, and they were costly, which suggests that the elite participated in this. Again, those that had the resources and the money to spend on things like this. So you're talking about the politicians, you're talking about the billionaires, you're talking about, <clears throat> not that Bill Gates is a part of that, I have no idea, but the Bill Gates who are billionaires or the owners of Amazon who make $120 billion, they're worth $120 billion. That's a lot of money and you can do a lot of things. I think I calculated it out and it came up to like $500 million a month or $50 million a month you could spend. Could you spend a $50 million a month? Yeah, you know, some of you are like, yeah, I could. I don't think you could. I don't think you could. There's just no way. There's no way. You could take care of the homeless, that's for sure, right? You could build some housing for the homeless with that kind of money. That just tells you the corruptness of man. And it also shows you that we could solve homelessness. We really could. There's enough money around to do that. I calculated, you know, I'm going to be taking a trip <clears throat> to India, <clears throat> and I've got to raise some money. I have 1,400 friends on my Facebook, on church, and then, and then my personal Facebook. And so I thought, what would it take if all of them donated to my trip? How much would they have to donate? And I calculated $5. $5, that's not a whole lot. That's one lunch. And if everybody were to go to the website and say, Pastor Rubin's Indian Mission Trip, and donate $5, I'd have enough to take with me to train them and also feed them. Not just go over there, but also then feed the churches that are there too for $5, calculate it, and it comes out to somewhere around five to $7,000. So I think we have more than enough resources. Uh, we just use it uh, on ourselves. 
and it goes really fast. So, um, filthiness of fornication, verse 5. And on her forehead the name was written, Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots, and of the abominations of the earth. Now, Roman prostitutes frequently whore, wore a headband with their names engraved on it. When you went to a temple in Rome, you would be able to name the prostitute that you wanted because they would have a headband and they would put their name on it. And so using the same idea that they had names written on their foreheads. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. Um, many believe that the title is, is not literally Babylon, but it's a spiritual mystery representation, which is the source or mother of all idolatry, abomination, spiritual idolatry, harlotry. And she's kind of embodied with satanic rituals, a, a one world government, not necessarily one religion. Some point that this is the Roman Catholic Church, which I would say it includes the Roman Catholic Church, but includes also many, many other churches that are out there. Um, you have churches that call themselves churches like like the church that's on Etowanda that worships marijuana. You know, what is it called again? I always forget. Oh. <laughs> you guys all, the vault, you know. Uh, you go there and you can smoke marijuana and worship whatever it is that you worship. And so these kind of churches are going to be involved in this kind of satanic uh, great Babylon. But the angel said to me, verse 7, why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her which has a seven heads and the ten horns. Now, it appears that the harlot rides the Antichrist system. If it is a system, uh, a religious system, then the religious system, the Antichrist, and Satan himself uh, will be a part of that false trinity that will be associated with that system of that time. And they're going to be uh, working together in creating this one world uh, economic religious system uh, in order to control all mankind. But the angel, or verse 8, the beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose name from the foundation of the world when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. Now, interesting statement there about the book of life, right? Notice that it says there that those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. So apparently, names are written in the book of life before the world even was created. This is how God has foreknowledge of everything. It's telling us that God knows all things in the future. So God knew that you would accept Jesus Christ at one point in your life. God knows if that accepting of Jesus Christ is real or not real, whether you have really surrendered or not. We can't tell. We can only tell by the fruit. The fruit will show us that, yeah, maybe and, and maybe not. Because some people are good at, at creating fruit, and they look very religious and so forth, and they will go to church and do all kinds of things. But in time, we'll see by their divisions, by their gossiping, by their bitterness and, and so forth that continues to pop up and... And you go, something's not right there. And then you have the other person who says, yeah, I've accepted, but then they really have no desire for godly things. And that's just fruit showing that there's possibly no true repentance there in their life. God knows all that. So before the foundations were, before the world was created, he already knew that you would accept him as Lord and Savior. That is such a concept that is difficult to grasp because we're so finite, right? We're not infinite like God. And I remember dealing with it many times, especially when I'm struggling with my sin, sins. And I start asking, God, why did you call me? Why did you save me? I can't even keep these commandments. I can't be holy and set apart for you. I keep failing, so maybe I'm not called. And I struggle with that back and forth. When I believe the word that says he's called me before the foundations of the world, I have to believe then he's called me before the foundations of the world because a believer believes what he says and doesn't believe what he feels. Because I feel like 
He hasn't called me at times. I feel like it because I'm looking at my situation, my own sin, like Paul said in Romans chapter 7. But then he said, thank God, in chapter 8, that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And I know it says in the, you know, at the, at the end of that, uh, who are called according, but that's not in the original language. It makes it very clear in the original language that it's those who are called by Jesus Christ, it alone, his work. And when we believe in that, then that gives us the faith to say, he's called me before the foundations of the world. I know he has. And so I know he's going to work everything out. And then ultimately, if this is all a failure, which is, is, isn't, I'm still going to go to heaven because I know that beyond a shadow of a doubt because he is faithful to his his word. And so our names are written in the book of life. And in this case, their names were not written in the book of life. Now that, that causes me to ask a question. Sometimes you try to help someone. You present to them the gospel. You present to them opportunities. And they'll tell you stories and how they want it, but their life doesn't show it. And so they reject it. Do you go after them? Patty would say God would leave the 99 and go after the one. <clears throat> but what if they're not called? What if God had not called them before the foundations of the world? No matter what you do, they're not coming back. So sometimes you have to just leave them alone. And I know that I love that scripture because God would, I would want him to come after me, you know, especially. And I think he would come after those whose names are written in the book of life. But then we have a picture of the prodigal son. Did the father go after the son? No, he didn't. So you have the other picture too. So there's a balance there, right? And so I think that we can't put that on man. Well, pastor, you need to go uh, after that one. Like, boy, I'd, I'd be going after everyone. You know how long that would take me? I got a message just the other, just today, this morning. I hear that uh, you guys do counseling. I'm like, where did you hear that? You know, you know, I get calls. I hear that you guys have money for housing. I'm like, where did you hear that? So, so now I've got to respond to these things, you know, and it's like, I don't have time for all this. So it's like, yes, we do counseling. Give me a call if you're really interested. And I know that's going to cut it because they're really not. And usually they don't, they don't call back. So what if it's God who goes after them, right? Because God is the one that knows whether they're called or not. God is the one that knows their very heart and what he has to allow them to go through before he can bring them back. And he'll allow you to go through things, believe me. In fact, more than likely, the things we go through is because God is trying to wake us up. So they were not in the book of life, which is interesting. He goes on. <clears throat> what did I do here? Nine. Nine. So thank you. I didn't change the page. Now, here is the mine which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sats or sits. Uh, many quickly associate the seven mountains with Rome and the papyacy because Rome is well known uh, to have the seven hills there in Rome. So they'll say, well, that's got to be Rome then. That is the false uh, prophet here. In the Bible, mountains are sometimes a figure of governments such as in Daniel chapter 235, the city of Rome is built on hills and not mountains. So some suggest that it can't be hills, but it's mountains. It is probably better to see the seven mountains as representing seven kingdoms or kingdoms described in Revelation 17.10 here. Um, so I believe, because there's a discrepancy there between hills and mountains, I believe that it's probably speaking of nations the superpowers of some sort. We don't know who they are, but they're going to be uh, with and helping uh, this great harlot. And there are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. And the beast that was and is not, he himself also the eighth and is in the seventh and is going to perdition, that is, to hell. So they're all participating and working with one another. Now 10 kings uh, to come, which will be the allies of Antichrist. Look at verse 12 and 13. Then 10 horns, which you saw, are 10 kings who have received no kingdoms as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings uh, with the beast. These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. Isn't that always the case? Men always want 
power. That's what they say about Trump. He wants power. He loves power. That's how he's become great, his power. And he's able to use his power. And most men that are successful are able and capable of using their power. They just have a way of flinging it and using it you know, for, for their own purposes. And these kings all want power. When we watch movies, it's always about some guy wanting to destroy the world so he can become the ruler and reign over all the earth, right? Or some government that says, no, destroy the whole earth, cause chaos so that, so that we can come in and take over everything. It's always about power. That theme is in everything that we see in life. It's setting everything up. It's just so clear how the Antichrist does that. And it says in verse 14, These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. Now, who's the Lamb? Jesus Christ. For He is Lord of lords, and He is King of kings. And those who are with Him are called, chosen, and faithful. Are you with Him? Are you with Him? He's our King of kings. He's our Lord of lords, and that's capital K with a little K. At the end, he is the one that will stand and rule and reign and have power and authority over all. As every man, every child, every woman will knee and bow before him and call him Lord and Savior for eternity. He will ultimately win. Then he said to me, the waters which you saw where the, har where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. So they're going to turn on each other, <laughs> as usually is the case, right? It's usually the case. And that's what I'm praying. I'm praying that as the vault is trying to grow bigger and bigger, that eventually human nature kicks in, and, and whoever's running it and whoever's getting the help, they all start fighting with each other. You know, and then it just gets destroyed. That's my prayer. And, and I'll guarantee you that's what's going to happen. You watch. That's what will happen, unless they're able to keep it under one person, and he just kicks everyone out. So there's going to be this in, internal war that's taking place uh, during that time. Verse 17, for God has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind, and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. Notice how much God's in control. He lays it on their heart that they would battle against each other. And that's what I'm praying that God would lay it on their hearts. Let God take care of it. He'll take care of it. That they lose everything. And that God's word would be fulfilled. That gives us an insight to how powerful God's word is and how much we should live by God's word. And the woman whom you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. So this great Babylon. God makes it very clear to us in the Gospels that everything will pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away. But he said this, not one word, not one dot, not one tittle, which is just a little tiny mark of a dot, will pass away of his word. It stands from Genesis to Revelation. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't live by the word of God. We get an idea sometimes that here we have the word of God. I've gone to a couple of Bible studies, so now I know what God wants me to do and how I, how I ought to live. And that's not true. You have to read his Bible daily from Genesis to Revelation. You've got to be in his word to have it continually cleanse you and bring you insight and remind you of things uh, about, about God. We studied uh, Leviticus chapter 3 this last week about the fellowship that we're to have you know, with God, the peace that we have with God. You know, and for me, I was really ministered to as I was studying it, as I was presenting it, because it reminded me, Lord, I need to have that peace that only you can give. I can't trust in men. I can't try to find my men and my peace in men or in people. It's got to be in you and you alone. And that's a reminder. And I forget that sometimes because you get so involved with people and situations and drama. And then you forget, wait a minute, Jesus is my peace and I have to have peace in him. So we need to be in the word constantly. And then we need to choose to follow the word of God. Follow the word of God. Literally follow the word of God. If the word of God, I, I told this to my mom the other day. If the word of God said red is the color for Christians. And then we go around and say, I like blue. I don't care what the 
God says about red. I like blue. I just like blue. It makes me feel good. But God says red's your color. So what are we supposed to do? Take red. But it doesn't make any sense. And I'm just giving you a silly, ridiculous idea. You know. But that's how we should approach the word of God. We should approach the word of God that way. The Bible says worship God in spirit and in truth. Do we do that? James said, be doers of the word, not hearers only, otherwise we deceive ourselves. And a lot of us just like to hear it. Sounds great. I love the message. I love the stories. I love how God did that and did this. And God's word's powerful, but then we walk away and we don't do any of it. That's what they did in the times of Ezekiel. They told Ezekiel, wonderful message, great word. Oh, we were inspired, but they walked away and did nothing. And there are a lot of Christians today doing nothing uh, with the word of God. So the word of God is powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It is able to deliver mankind. My pastor, he was a heroin addict. And he was uh, um, pretty much uh, addicted to the stuff. And it was during the Jesus movement. And people were just coming to the Lord. And he saw all these kids coming to the Lord and being delivered from, from drugs. And so he decided, I'm going to do that. I'm going to give my life to the Lord completely, surrender it completely to God. And so he went and started going to church, fellowshipping, but, but he kept taking heroin. He kept shooting it. Finally, he just says, God, you got to deliver me from this. He didn't go to some rehab. He didn't go anywhere else. He just went to God. God, you got to deliver me from this. You, and he went to a room, sat down, and he cried, and he cried, and he cried, and he cried, and he cried out until he was so exhausted. He couldn't cry anymore. His whole heart was pouring out to God. Would you do something? I mean, he was screaming and yelling, and the, every fiber in his bone was saying, please deliver me from this. There wasn't anything in him that said, no, I want to keep it here just in case. And then all of a sudden, he woke up the next morning, and he said he was delivered, didn't need it anymore. It was gone. The desire was gone. No withdrawals, nothing. And it was a testimony of God's glory. Now, why doesn't God do that today? I think God wants to do it today. The problem is you don't have people totally surrendering to God. You don't have them getting on their knees and crying and crying and asking for deliverance if it means all day and the next and the next and the week until finally God gives you that deliverance. Because God will seek me and you will find me, God says. Anyway, I went way too far. I'm sorry. It's supposed to be a half an hour deep. But let's pray. <laughs> Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word and the power of your word and, and how exciting it is sometimes to just share it, Lord, with others. May you bless your people. May you deliver them. May you give them peace. Uh, Father, and Lord, may their names be written in the book of life before the foundations of the world, Lord. <sighs> Father, meet their every needs, Lord, and make yourself very known to them, Lord, that they may have a personal relationship with you, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for joining us. If you have any prayer requests, then please uh, post it there or private message me and we will pray for you. God bless.